Nelson had asked to read Zephaniah chapter 3, verses 14 to 20. That's Zephaniah 3, verses 14 to 20. Sing, daughter Zion, shout aloud, Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, daughter Jerusalem. The Lord has taken away your punishment. He has turned back your enemy. The Lord, the King of Israel, is with you. Never again will you fear any harm. On that day, they will say to Jerusalem, Do not fear, Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you, the mighty warrior who saves. He will take great delight in you. In his love, he will no longer rebuke you, but will rejoice over you with singing. I will, re I will remove from you all who mourn, mourn over the loss of your appointed festivals, which is a burden and reproach for you. At that time, I will deal with all who oppressed you. I will rescue the lame. I will gather the exiles. I will give them praise and honor in every land where they have suffered shame. At that time, I will gather you. At that time, I will bring you home. I will give you honor and praise among all the peoples of the earth when I restore your fortunes before your very eyes, says the Lord. Lord's blessings to you, Nelson. I don't know how carefully you look at the prayer calendar, but when I was making the prayer calendar for November, I put down that next Sunday we would have a Thanksgiving emphasis, and it wasn't until later I realized that next Sunday is the first Sunday of Advent. So this Sunday is going to be the Thanksgiving emphasis. I have to confess, with all the stuff that's going on around us, I struggle with wondering about God's goodness. I think it's natural that we have these questions that we, we doubt from time to time. A logical question that I ask myself is, where is God in the midst of everything that's going on? Did, did God forget about us? Did God turn and look the other way? Why isn't he intervening? Why does it seem like everything is so difficult? And then, I realize I'm being nearsighted. I realize I'm only looking at right now. I'm looking at the last eight months. And I begin to back away a little bit, and I go, wait a minute. God's view is historical. God thinks in terms of history. And so his view is much broader. It's a bigger picture. And when we look back at history... We can see difficult times that people went through and then how God worked. And so perhaps we can't always see in the midst of it what God is doing. So I'm choosing. It's a choice. It's a, it's a conscious choice to believe and trust that the God of creation is a good God. And He is one who loves us all. And if you forget that, Probably the one verse that all Christians have memorized should come to your mind. And I included verse 17 of John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's the basis by which we can confess that God loves us, is trustworthy, and is good. So the essence of this sermon this morning is that God is good and compassionate. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here this morning. We pray, too, for those who are watching the service live and for those who will watch it later. We pray a blessing on each person that they would receive from you what they need. In your name we pray.
Amen. I came across a quote from Corrie ten Boom. If you don't know who she is, she, she and her family were a Christian family who hid Jewish people during the Nazi era. And because of that, they were arrested and sent to a concentration camp. I believe her father was also there too, but she was there with her sister. And she comments this way. Often I've heard people say, how good God is. We prayed that it would not rain for our church picnic and look at the lovely weather. And she says, yes, God is good when he sends good weather. But God was also good when he allowed my sister Betsy to starve to death before my eyes in a German concentration camp. She says, I remember one occasion when I was very discouraged there. Everything around us was dark, and there was darkness in my heart. Just stop and think. Compare that with what we're going through. It's, it's not even co comparable. And she remembers telling Betsy, I thought God had forgotten us. And Betsy replies, no, Corey, he's not forgotten us. Remember his word. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. And so Corey has this conclusion. There is an ocean of God's love available. There is plenty for everyone. May God grant you never to doubt that victorious love, whatever the circumstances. The text that Roland read requires some background. So if, you're open, you're, if you have your Bibles open to Zephaniah 3, I'm going to refer back to a couple other verses, but they will be up here as well. The first two and a half chapters of Zephaniah deal with the problems in Jerusalem, deal with what's going on, the struggles that they are facing. And in these first four verses, we have described, and I'm not reading all four verses, we have described the evil that was going on in Jerusalem, starting with verse 2 of Zephaniah 3. She, meaning Jerusalem, obeys no one, she accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. So it's just a description of what's going on in Jerusalem, how evil is pervasive throughout the land. And skipping down to verse 5. <clears throat> but the Lord is still in the city. He does what is right and never what is wrong. Every morning without fail, he brings justice to his people. And yet the unrighteous people there keep on doing wrong and are not ashamed. So I don't know where you put yourself in that story. I would suggest that we are the righteous. I think that's okay to do. And to recognize that even though there's evil around us, even though there's people making all kinds of wrong choices around us, that doesn't mean that God isn't present. God is still present, and he is still at work. Then we skip down to verses 11 to 13. On that day, Jerusalem will not be put to shame for all the wrongs you have done to me, because I will remove from you those who revel in your glory. Never again will you be haughty on my holy hill. But I will leave within you the meek, and the humble. Listen to that. Sounds like the Beatitudes, right? The remnant of Israel will trust in the name of the Lord. Blessed are the meek and the humble. Jesus' words, taken almost directly from Zephaniah 3.12. They will do no wrong. They will tell no lies. A deceitful tongue will not be found in their mouths. They will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. That's us. We have that choice in our lives to make those choices, to live righteous lives, to be influencers. As I preached a month or so ago, in this dark time, we can be the people who shed light on the world around us. We can be the people who bring something different into people's lives. Now, the key text 
It comes from Zephaniah 3, 14 to 20 that Roland read. We had the judgment in the first two and a half chapters, and now we have the good news, the reasons for celebrating God's goodness. And I'm referring to the Good News Bible here, so it'll be a little different than what Roland read. Starting at verse 14. Sing and shout for joy, people of Israel. Rejoice with all your heart, Jerusalem. Now remember, dark times, evil pervading, people wondering where God is, and here are our instructions. Sing and shout for joy. Rejoice with all your heart. What that tells me is we do not base our joy on circumstances. We don't base our praise of God on what's going on around us. We praise it on the fact that God is good. And then verse 15, the Lord has ended your punishment. He has removed all your enemies. The Lord, the King of Israel is with you. There is no reason now to be afraid. So there's a change. There's a turning around. There's something that's happening throughout Israel. Probably referred to today, we would call a revival or renewal. Something is happening and God is at work just as he has been, but people are beginning to respond. The time is coming when they will say to Jerusalem, do not be afraid, city of Zion. Do not let your hands hang limp. I love that last little phrase. In other words, don't go, ah. I don't know what I can do. There's just nothing we can do. Or throw up your hands and say, it's terrible. The time is coming when they will say to Jerusalem, do not be afraid. I was listening to a podcast this week of an interview with Rick Warren, pastor at Saddleback, author of Purpose Driven Church. He said that the phrase, do not be afraid or do not fear or have no fear, appears 365 times in the Bible. One for every day of the year. And right here is one of them. The Lord your God is with you. We're stating facts here. Zephaniah is telling us what is the truth. His power gives you victory. The Lord will take delight in you. And in his love, he will give you new life. He will sing and be joyful over you. As joyful as people at a festival, the Lord says, I have ended the threat of doom and taken away your disgrace. I love these word pictures. Imagine that God is singing over you. In your darkest moment, close your eyes and just picture that God is singing over you. And it says, as joyful as people at a festival. In other words, God's celebrating who we are. The time is coming. I will punish your oppressors. In other words, he's saying, that's not your job, as we have in Romans 12. I will rescue all the lame and bring the exiles home. I will turn their shame to honor, and all the world will praise them. The time is coming. I will bring your scattered people home. I will make you famous throughout the world. And make you prosperous once again. The Lord has spoken. History tells us that over and over again, following most difficult times, there's revival. There's change. The people of God begin to minister in the midst of difficult times. And God is at work. Things change. Renewal happens. The illustration I want to use this morning comes from Deuteronomy chapter 30. It's basically a story of how God restores and blesses the children of Israel. It has some similarities to the story I just read, but I'm going to read through this rather quickly and you'll get the gist of it. Deuteronomy 30, starting at verse 1. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you come on you, and you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations, so he's setting the scene, is that 
People have been spread out. It's been difficult times. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey Him with all your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you, people coming back to God, this is what will happen. Then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where He scattered you. The promises of God Read through Scripture and note the promises of God. Here is one. Your God will restore your fortunes. We can take that and apply it today. Whatever we've lost in the midst of this pandemic, God will restore our fortunes. I don't know what that means. You don't even know what that means. But we do know that it's a promise of God. Even if you have been banished to the most distant land under the heavens, from there, the Lord your God will gather you and bring you back. He will bring you to the land that belonged to your ancestors, and you will take possession of it. He will make you more prosperous and numerous than your ancestors. It reminds me of Job. All the stuff that was taken away from him, and in the end, he got even more back. The Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart, with all your soul, and live. Now stop and think about that a moment. What is happening to us right now? Right now, we are all evaluating our lives. We're taking a look at what is our relationship to God? Are we honoring him in our speech and in our actions and in the things that we write? That is circumcising our hearts. If we open ourselves to God, He is changing our hearts and our minds. That's the circumcision He's talking about here. The Lord your God will put all these curses on your enemies who will hate and persecute you. It's not our job to take revenge, to fight back. It's up to God. You will again obey the Lord and follow all His commands I am giving you today. Then the Lord your God will make you most prosperous in all the work of your hands and in the fruit of your womb, the young of your livestock, and the crops of your land. These are examples of God restoring to us. I would suggest he's going to restore to us even better than what we had. I don't know what that means but just the fact that we are probably all spending more time in silence before God, seeking Him, that in itself is prospering. The Lord will again delight in you and make you prosperous, just as He delighted in your ancestors. If you obey the Lord your God and keep His commands and decrees that are written in this book of the law, and turn to the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. There's an if. God will prosper you if, if you keep His commands, if you turn to the Lord, if you open your heart to Him. And again, there it says, He delights over you. An illustration comes, a brief one from Psalm 73, verses 21 to 26. This is an example of how Circumcision of the heart or confession and repentance brings restoration of relationship with others and with God. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. That's the psalmist just being honest, just saying, I've done some really stupid things. I've talked to people in wrong ways. I've acted in wrong ways. And I acted out of bitterness and out of grief. I was senseless and ignorant. It's a confession. We could all confess this. Yet, I am always with you 
You hold me by my right hand. This is the psalmist talking to God. The psalmist acknowledging to God that even when I'm acting in ignorant ways, I am with you. You hold me by my right hand. And so my suggestion is that sometimes maybe use that as an illustration. When we're having wrong attitudes, when we're acting improperly, when we're just ready to give up, maybe just reach up and say, I'm holding you or you're holding me. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you will take me into glory. I think that's a little bit of what we're all going through right now. We love, wouldn't it be awesome if Jesus just came back today? <laughs> you know, you guide us with your counsel and afterwards you will take us into glory. And then I'm using a different version, the new century version of the same verse, compare them a little bit. You guide me with your advice. In other words, the word of God and fellow Christians. And then I like this last part. And later, you will receive me in honor. So it might not just necessarily be the second coming, but it might be that as we seek God's advice, we find honor from him. Whom have I in heaven but you? The psalmist writes. And earth has nothing I desire besides you. Can we say that? Can we honestly say, earth has nothing I desire besides you? My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. These reminders from Scripture that God is good, that God has not forgotten us. He's not lost, left us, or forsaken us. I came across this quote from Maud Royden, a 20th century internationally known British preacher and lecturer and author. I love this. When you have nothing left but God, then you become aware that God is enough. As things are stripped away from us that we really didn't need at all anyway, and they were distractions from seeking God, we realize God is enough. I think that we need this reminder periodically. Hopefully it's not always through these difficult times. Maybe there'll be a discipline that we learn to look to God regularly. He's not only good when things go our way, but in the midst of difficulty. As we look back, it's often in those times that we realize how God has been good. We need to avoid the fickleness of the world that measures God's goodness by circumstances. We live above the circumstances, not beneath them. So as we approach Thanksgiving Day, which I'm sure for most of us will look very different than normal, Let's give thanks and not complain. Let's choose to recognize that God is present with us no matter how we celebrate Thanksgiving. The Apostle Paul understood that God is good no matter what the circumstances are in life, so I leave you with his words this morning from Philippians 4, 12 to 13. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Let's pray. Lord God of the universe, you are a good God. You are fully trustworthy. Forgive us for our doubts. We offer ourselves to you anew today. We choose to serve you, to honor you, and to acknowledge you as our Lord.